if you ask me, this whole thing is going to end badly. So what exactly do you mean, Ronnie? Oh, uh, don't know. Just a feeling, I guess. Strong feeling. Oh, boy. Welcome to the Quipster Film Review Podcast. My name is Vince Leo. I am the author of the film review website, Quipster.net. I invite you to check out over 4,000 of my written reviews. You can read there anytime. Quipster.net is where to go. Q-W-I-P-S-T-E-R.net. While you're there, I do encourage you to check out my other podcast called Around the World in 80s Movies, covering, of course, films of the 1980s. You can find a link to that at that website, Quipster.net. Today I'm going to be looking at the latest film from Jim Jarmusch. It is called The Dead Don't Die, one of his rare excursions into a horror movie, probably his most horrific. It's an R-rated film. It does have zombie violence, gore, and for its language. The runtime is an hour and 44 minutes. Bill Murray and Adam Driver are the main stars. Tom Waits, Tilda Swinton, Danny Glover, Steve Buscemi, Caleb Landry Jones, Selena Gomez, and many others are in this film. As I mentioned, Jim Jarmusch is the director. He also writes the screenplay. Now, Jim Jarmusch has taken on horror before, to be sure. In 2013, he had a vampire flick called Only Lovers Left Alive. I consider that much more of a drama than it is a horror film, though. This one takes his usual lightheartedly droll approach to cinema. It builds on this quirky and bluesy and lackadaisical vibe that he spent his entire career cultivating. And like the zombies that are the subject of this film, it brings people back to life in a certain way for Jarmusch. And that's kind of a meta aspect of this film. Jarmusch here resurrecting at least one actor from each of his films that he's ever made over the course of his nearly 40-year career as a director. This one has more of an outwardly conscious agenda, though, than many of his films, but it's still full of Jarmuschisms, and it is rife with an homage to the genre, especially paying respect to George Romero's original Night of the Living Dead. As far as the plot goes, after the Earth's rotation ends up getting disturbed due to environmental fallout that results from so-called polar fracking, strange natural phenomena began occurring all over the globe, including in one area at least, the dead coming back to life and they end up feasting on the living. Bill Murray here stars in his second zombie comedy after he appeared very briefly in Zombieland. He plays Cliff Robertson, no, not the actor, the chief of police for this small Mayberry-esque town of Centerville, Centerville being an homage to the town in Frank Zappa's 1971 musical feature called 200 Motels. Cliff, along with his partner in fighting very little crime in Centerville, Officer Ronnie Peterson, Seemingly an in-joke, Adam Driver plays Peterson. He also has been in two Jarmusch films, really in a row. He plays a character in his last film called Patterson. So Patterson to Peterson, I wonder what could be next. They find themselves having to deal with the gruesome deaths that they uncover, coming to the realization that things may not end well for themselves or their community if they don't take decisive action. There are a lot of short side stories to this film, but character touches are really part of the appeal for Jim Jarmusch. His film is knowingly dumb in its approach. Many zombie films, even classics, tend to be, though. Financing proved to be a difficult task for Jarmusch. There are a number of effects shots and some high-concept ideas to take into account here. And due to the difficulty in keeping this cast together, the shoot was a shortened one. Co-star Adam Driver was only able to commit to about 20 days of availability to film, and it rained a good deal of the time during the shoot in sweltering heat. Jarmusch ended up contracting walking pneumonia during the making of the movie, in addition to breaking one of his toes, and he pushed through all of that to work 15-hour days, and all of this caused further delays. Now, as with some of the better films in the subgenre, the story here proves to be a metaphor. If you look under the surface of the gore and the horror, that's something that George Romero himself had carried through with his series of zombie classics. In fact, the themes here are really reminiscent of the same things that they were talking about 50 years ago in a Romero film. Jarmusch says that the moral lessons were not learned over those 50 years, and they still exist today, so that's why he basically doubles down on them. Jarmusch understands all of this. He attempts to draw out the metaphor. It's maybe too apparent here, though, even ending with one of the characters essentially spelling out in words what the film is actually all about, despite 
proverbial neon signs that pointed out all along the way for us. Jarmusch thinks that we're on the road here to another catastrophic event for the planet due to our lack of care for the environment in the pursuit of profits and the people of the world. They walk around like zombies. The undead call out their preoccupations. They mutter almost incoherently such things as coffee, free Wi-Fi, and Chardonnay. We're all preoccupied with a host of ceaseless distractions, materialism, rampant consumerism, all of these things that keep us from doing anything about the catastrophe that's all going to do us in. And what's more is that death doesn't care who you are or your political persuasions, even though we seem to think these things are super important. We're all in the same boat in a global catastrophe and should be working together to solve these things. And yet we're too walled off by our own making to see the common threats and even blame each other for the reason that we're going to die in the end. Now, as far as the humor goes, much of it plays off of this leisurely, mostly deadpan reactions of these goofy, likable characters. They seem kind of almost nonchalant in some respects to the horror show that's going on around them. They're intentionally underplayed to a large extent by these actors for comic effect. On occasion, there's going to be an offhand reference to such things as George Romero, whose own zombie movies seem to be where Jamish started and pretty much ended his research into zombie flicks. This really doesn't call out a lot of other zombie films that have come out since. Somewhat jarring are the occasional metatextual references. For instance, Adam Driver's character is revealed to have a Star Wars-related keychain. The motel owner's last name is Perkins. The 1968 Pontiac Le Mans that's driven by the hipsters is identical to the one that you can find in Night of the Living Dead. They're all tossed into the mix by these suddenly sometimes self-aware characters who occasionally seem to break character in order to discuss the movie that they're in. They comment on the theme song from Sturgill Simpson or Adam Driver's pre-knowledge that it's all going to end badly for them all. He's the only actor we hear that was given the entire script and By the way, the film actually doesn't have a satisfactory ending, so maybe he's right that the film does end badly after all. When the Wu-Tang Clan's RZA shows up as a delivery driver working for Wu-PS instead of UPS, you get the sense that Jarmusch has really taken a decidedly kitchen sink approach to his comedy in The Dead Don't Die. But that's not nearly as absurd as the Tilda Swinton character, a Scottish Buddhist mortician named Zelda Winston, kind of a playoff of Tilda Swinton, She's skilled with a katana. There's a moment of dialogue here that gives away Jarmusch's age. The name Zelda is commented upon by one of the characters as sounding somewhat familiar, not due to the rampantly popular video game, of course, The Legend of Zelda, or an actress in Poltergeist named Zelda Rubenstein, or a character in Stephen King's Pet Cemetery. All of these things were cultural touchstones for a lot of people who are much younger, and Pet Cemetery was actually about the undead in many respects, so it would have been a good tie-in. But the character mentions that, oh, Zelda, that's the name of F. Scott Fitzgerald's wife. And strangely, that character that calls out Fitzgerald and his wife is someone in her maybe 20s or 30s. And that's the only Zelda reference she knows. It seems a little hard to believe. If at first glance, Tilda Swinton's character seems like she stepped off of a different movie set and into this one, it really only gets more so from there. Her last scene really takes this thing to another dimension. Now, those unfamiliar with Jim Jarmusch as a filmmaker and are just looking for a good zombie flick, I think those people are the ones who may come away with some disappointment for The Dead Don't Die. The filmmaker is really not concerned with making a riveting or pulse-pounding horror film here or to really ramp up any of the scares or suspense. He's really mostly interested in his characters and how they continue to interact with the world around them as things seem to be growing bleaker and more depressing. It's not an unenjoyable experience, but definitely I would consider this a lesser effort in the Jarmusch filmography, and that's partially because this is well-traveled material in its basic plotline. We've seen a lot of zombie films, especially recently, and The Walking Dead is still on the air, and also partially because what's distinctly Jarmusch also dips into his familiar bag of humor, the kooky characters that inhabit his offbeat world. We've seen a lot of this material before, Jarmusch does seem to be having fun tinkering with this new genre, but I also think that it's a a kind of narrative that there's been no shortage of explorations into in recent years, and that leaves Jarmusch's The Dead Don't Die feeling like it's lived 
beyond its need to exist, much like some of the characters in this film. So I can't quite give it a full recommendation. I would say it's a real borderline call. And what I do when I have a borderline call on a first time watch is to give it the lower of the two grades. So I'm going to give The Dead Don't Die two and a half stars out of four. Two and a half stars on my scale means that I do think it had all the tools, it had all the talent to be a movie I would probably recommend to most people who like this genre of films, but it just falls short. It's a little flat doesn't really come to life and I feel it's regurgitating a lot of things that Jarmusch is known for. Certainly if you're a big fan of his, you're probably going to still enjoy it enough to find it worthwhile, but I think this movie, which probably is his biggest crossover appeal movie, is not likely to garner him any of the new fans that he may have thought he could get by making a zombie flick. So two and a half stars out of four is the best I can give The Dead Don't Die, at least as of this viewing. Thanks, everyone, for listening. I hope that you enjoyed this review. If you have your own thoughts on The Dead Don't Die and you want to let me know about them, you can find my contact information on my website. That's at quipster.net, Q-W-I-P-S-T-E-R.net. And until next time, thank you, everyone. And please enjoy your time anytime you get to go to the movie.